If you're trying to make any kind of meaningful, effective change in your life, you've come to the right place. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lori Bischoff. It is time to talk shift. Yes, today we are going to be diving into, well, trying to get unstuck when it comes to your livelihood and maybe considering some new possibilities. So we're going to start with some talk about entrepreneurship. Um, what exactly does that all encompass? What does it require? What are some of the biggest misconceptions? And for those of you who want to oh, get your voice out to uh, more people, to a larger audience, you've got something to say, well, we are going to get into the particulars of podcasting, the do's and don'ts, how to get started, and the mistakes to avoid. So we are going to be going through all of this with entrepreneur and businessman Conrad Thompson. Let me tell you a little bit about Conrad. First of all, full transparency, Conrad is a friend of our family. He is a colleague of my husband, which is how I know he is so brilliant. He really is an awesome businessman. Not only is he a 19-year veteran of the mortgage industry, but he is also an I think a pretty amazing example of somebody that turned his passion, something that he really loved into a thriving podcast empire, becoming a two-time podcast of the year award recipient. But Conrad humbly says that most importantly, he is a husband and dad from Alabama. So <laughs> welcome to the show, Conrad. I'm so happy to have you. Uh, thanks for having me on. I uh, I feel underdressed. <laughs> well, you know what? I think you look perfect because we're all about just showing up as ourselves, being our authentic, as the there trend du jour goes, right? Ourselves. So we're we're more concerned about um, the quality of our content and delivering really good stuff to help our people, our listeners, all shift. I know you're into that. So yes, ma'am. So you're perfect. All right. So this year. As, uh, as everyone, oh my God, is so anxious for it to be done and get passed. But it's been an upheaval, right, for everybody, whether you are an employed person, you know, employed by somebody else, or if you're self-employed, if you're an entrepreneur, either way, this, this year has really felt like, it's like the 21st um, century version of survival of the fittest, you know, on so many levels. And I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what to do next, how to get unstuck, um, how to maybe reinvent themselves. So I figured, you know what, it would be great to talk to you because you are a self-made man and you've got a lot of experience in being an entrepreneur. And then of course, as we mentioned, podcasting. So let's start with this. What, what do you think should be a person's driving motivation for wanting to start their own business, be an entrepreneur? Like, is it, should it be out of necessity? Should it be out of passion, filling a need, solving a problem, um, the path of least resistance? What's your take on that? Well, you know, I came from a family of entrepreneurs, my, mm -hmm. uh, my both my grandparents on their own business, and I had aunts and uncles on both sides that own their own business. So it was probably in my blood. But mm -hmm. very early on, I learned that you know, I could let someone else determine my worth for me. And another man could say you're worth this amount per hour, or I could decide my own worth. And that meant I would probably wind up in sales. So I pursued sales and I learned early on that everything in life is sales. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I'm not a salesman as if that was a bad thing, but everyone is selling something, especially yeah. in business. So once I got comfortable with that, it became a matter of me figuring out what I wanted to sell. And I was recruited into the mortgage business and I started out as a loan officer and then eventually became a branch manager and then became an owner. And it was just a passion of mine because I really fell in love with helping people. And that's what you do when you're in the mortgage industry. You help people get out of an apartment and realize the dream of home ownership and a place where they can make memories that become sort of the backdrop of their family albums. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can help people, you know, consolidate debt and retire on time and really reach their financial goals. And I just didn't think that the banks had done the best job of really educating consumers about what a mortgage was. Everyone was sort of trying to distract you with cheap closing costs and low interest rates, but they never really talked to you about what your actual 
monthly budget looks like and what the end of your loan looks like. And I did a little research and I learned that the word mortgage is actually Latin for pledge until death. And oh my was, God, <laughs> that seems <laughs> ominous. Well, it was an instrument designed by banks to get you to give them 29% of your gross monthly income every month until you die. And once that really clicked in my brain, I realized I can really help people with this. And yeah. uh, it became a passion of mine. And I focused less on the money and more on the work and what I enjoyed and how I can help more people. And that old cliche is true. You know, when you quit worrying about the money, it just sort of took care of itself. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the way, I, I fell into podcasting and found a way to marry them together. And uh, here we are now on uh, Talk and Shift. Yeah, right. That's that's really interesting. I had no clue about um, the roots of the word mortgage, and I'd yeah. love to find out the root meaning, you know, of where where words come from. So I find that to be fascinating, and um, yeah, and very eye opening. That's very enlightening because you're right. People don't really understand what that means. I mean, when we first bought um, uh, our house, our first home, uh, I didn't know. I didn't even know like. I don't even think I had heard the word mortgage. Right. Uh, you know, I was like, what? And then when I started hearing that, I was like, I don't, why don't they just call it a home loan? Why is it called right. a mortgage? Why right. does, what's with the terminology to, you know, confuse everybody or, you know, whatever. So, um, so that's a little bit of interesting history, but I didn't know anything about what points meant. I didn't know what, mm -hmm. you know, why it was more advantageous or less advantageous to have a, you know, a 15 year or a 30 year or adjustable right. rate more. All that stuff was like totally speaking Chinese to me. So it, it's, uh, it's a lot to take in, but it's so important, like you said, for people to understand that so that they can make an educated choice about what they're signing on the dotted line for, because otherwise, yeah, you end up, you could end up getting into a situation like so many people did in 2008, where you are um, literally like signing your future away in right. many degrees. <laughs> well, what I noticed early in my career was a lot of folks, you know, when they were cash strapped, so they're, they're having trouble, you know, there's more month at the end of the money and they've got to figure out how to budget these last few days before that next paycheck comes in. And that's a struggle that a lot of Americans, especially here in Alabama, where I'm from, we're dealing with. And I very quickly realized what they would do all, more often than not is go to a, a secondary finance company like a city financial or an American general or someone like that. They would take out a small loan, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, but they would agree to make it a second mortgage at like twenty-eight or thirty-one percent, just an astronomical rate. And those folks never got out of the rat race. They were just mm -hmm. overpaying an in interest every single month. But no one ever sat them down and explained, hey, you need to understand what's available to you, what's possible, and the best possible way to manage this debt. Because I've always been raised to believe that. Like my grandfather as a kid, he used to say, son, the only good snake's a dead snake. Well, I have friends who have pets, and I don't necessarily agree with that. However, I understand what he's trying to say, and I think the only good debt is no debt. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the real freedom and peace of mind that I was really subscribing to early on in my career. And so to answer, your, I guess, your first question about entrepreneurship, I saw an opportunity where no one was really explaining that. Everyone mm -hmm. in my industry now was talking about interest rate and closing costs. No one was talking about retiring on time. And I saw, you know, people started working a little later. You know, when I was growing up, everyone aimed to retire at 62 or 65. But yeah. when we go down to the local Walmart or swing through a local drive through more often than not, we were dealing with a person who was older than that. And it's probably not because they're worried about making their Lexus payment. They still have a house. Right. So once I understood, hey, it's not that these people were lazy or not hardworking, it's that they just didn't have the right information to write, make the right financial decision. So yeah. I, I started my whole career with this one sentence, what does the end of your loan look like? And once people really understood what that meant, it was a light bulb moment, not just for strangers, but for my own parents. My mm -hmm. parents had refinanced over and over because the banker that they knew, like, and trust would come to them and say, oh, we can refinance you with no closing costs and reduce your interest rate. But what did they do? They just started all over again on a new 30 year loan. So they're just perpetually in debt, 29% yeah, yeah. of their income every month until they die. That really is what mortgage is, pledge until mm -hmm. death. And, and I wanted to break that. I mm -hmm. saw an opportunity and, and it worked. I love that. I love that because you're right. You, you're, even though you're in the business of selling something, but what you're really also doing is you're sharing something in a way that is helpful 
to people, that's good for people, that's not trying to take advantage of people, but right. actually do right by them. Um, your heart's in the right place. And that's, that's nice to see, uh, you know, in a day and age where everybody is, everybody really is selling something, but not everybody is selling something that is necessarily good for the buyer. It's good. Yeah, for that's exactly right. We, we, we actually do uh, a test to make sure that there is a real benefit. We're reducing their term. We're drastically reducing their monthly payment. We're eliminating a second mortgage. We're converting a, an adjustable rate to a fixed rate. If it doesn't pass our smell test, we're not going to originate the loan. I mean, there has to be real benefits to the borrower. And, and unfortunately, a lot of folks weren't adhering to that back in 08, and we got ourselves in a mess, and we've dug ourselves out now. But the, uh, the experts believe that we might be headed towards another sort of shaky situation. And I'm happy to say that our customers are, are going to be ahead of the curve because we preach a 15-year loan. And you don't even see that promoted on television most of the time. People are really mm -hmm. talking about 30-year loans. But, mm -hmm. I mean, 30 years from now for you and 30 years from now for me are two totally different things. But yes. let's not assume that everyone is sort of one size fits all. And, and let's, let's cater to their goals. What are they? And once yeah. you really discover that, then you can help people reach those goals. And, man, you're going to be their mortgage advisor for life. And that theory has really worked for us in my company. Yeah, clearly. Uh, that's amazing. So, okay. So as far as let's bring this back around to, um, I mean, you started out uh, in this business and then you eventually turned, turned it into your own business, correct? Yes, ma'am. And so you became, um, even though you were employed by someone else when you start, but you ultimately took all of your skills and knowledge that you had acquired, your experience, you turned it into your own entrepreneurial initiative. Yeah. Yes, so. Okay, so what are, what would you say um, are, is like the biggest thing that people uh, need to know if they are embarking on the path of, of being their own boss, starting their own business? What are some of the biggest misconceptions? And to you, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Well, that's a lot. Uh, yeah. Entrepreneurship, I think to me would mean, you know, you sort of carve out your own lot in life. You know, it means you won't be dictated to, but ultimately what it means is a ton of accountability for yourself. You know, I, I'm no longer making, when you're an employee, you make decisions for you and your family, and that's pretty much it. But when I make a decision now, I have to consider hundreds of families that will be affected by these decisions. And with that comes great responsibility. And I think a lot of folks, sometimes I'll hear people say, oh, I want to own my own business. Okay, well, what kind of business do you want to own? Well, I don't really know. I just want to be my own boss. No, what you want is no boss, but it turns out we're our worst boss because we're going to make ourselves get up early. We're going to make ourselves stay late. We're going to make ourselves pay work weekends. We're going to work for less money for a long, long time before it ever hits in most right. cases. Right. And I think a lot of people have a misconception that, well, no, you just, you know, you're on vacation all the time and somebody else is doing all the work. That's right. not why you start a business. Uh, that, no, and if you're reality. on vacation all the time, you're probably not going to be very successful with your business. Correct. Correct. So, yeah. you know, I was fortunate to find something I really enjoyed. Uh, but, you know, I don't have a great work-life balance and I work a lot, but I love it. And so the yeah. old cliche of you, know, you work, you, you never work a day in your life. Well, that really applies to me. I'm working from the minute I wake up till I go to bed, but it's fun. And I yeah. look forward to it. And I don't feel like I'm at work and I feel like I need to be home or I'm at home and I feel like I need to be at work. I found a way to sort of bring it all together and have fun. And uh, I've involved my parents and uh, my, my siblings and the name of my company is First Family Mortgage. I got the whole freaking company filled with, with parents now. So mom's there, dad's there, sister's there, two cousins are there. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to have nieces and nephews there. I'm, both of my daughters are going to be there one day. Once upon a time, my wife was there. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. a family affair. I don't feel like I'm, I'm sacrificing anything in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you're putting it, when you're getting up early, because you can't wait to dive into, you know, what turns you on all day, which is your business. And, yeah. you know, you have to make yourself call it a day and go home and go to bed. That's, you know, that's a, that's a happy place to be. But, um, but you're right. I think a lot of people um, think they don't realize the responsibility that comes with it, like you said, it's a lot. Um, and I think for a lot of people too, um, there's not everybody is good without some 
an imposed structure on their day. Right. You know, if you're going to get up and make shift happen all day, um, yeah. you have got to have the discipline to impose some structure on your day, you know, what needs to be done, you know, your non-negotiables of the day. And I think that um, not everyone is cut out for that. Not, you know, entrepreneurship and, and having your own business, it sounds, it's kind of like people that have never owned a restaurant dreaming about having a restaurant you right you know it sounds oh i have these great recipes i could make this great food if you build it they will come and you know it is it is not a uh, it's not a it's not a fun business when you start to get into all that goes into having to make that work and manage people and product and services and everything that goes along with it um you're married to it so you really got to you really got to be in love with that marriage and and i think a lot of people actually do better when, um, when they're working for somebody else and they don't have the load of that responsibility. It's, you know, that one's not better than the other, but they are absolutely completely different animals. And there's, I think there's nothing wrong with being willing to be a great employee for somebody, clock in, do your job. And when you leave, you're, you're done. You don't have right. to, you know, you're done. You can go do whatever else you want to do in life. So you really have to think through carefully what your you know, what it is you're, you're interested in turning into a business, what your values are, you know, and what you want your, your work-life balance to be, I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, two points on that, I guess. One, I would ask yourself, would you still want to do this if it meant you worked more hours for less money? And if the answer is yes, then you really should be an entrepreneur. But if the answer is no, I want more money and less hours, well, you're probably not picking the right way long-term. Secondly, yeah. when you were talking about um, I thought that was important. How can you be disciplined to really stay at it all day? I internalized a long time ago, probably 2002. So about a year into my mortgage business. Um, whenever I'm not busy during the day, I have a free moment. I ask myself, what one thing can I do that will make me and my family the most money right now? And then I'm going to do that. So whatever that one thing is, that's how I work through my priorities. I, I'm big on to-do lists. I, I use a past mm -hmm. calendar. In my, uh, in my iPhone now, but beforehand I used to old school, just write it down on a sheet of paper and I would yeah. do it before I went home at the end of the day. So I knew when I came in to work the next day, here's everything I got to do in order of, of importance. But number one was always, what's going to make us the most money? What's going to provide the most mm -hmm. revenue for my business, for myself, for my family, for my household? And I would do that. And so whenever I get through the day and I find myself getting off track, which still happens today, I come back to what makes me the most money right now. I need to go do that right now. And that has, has really worked for me. But the real challenging part of being an entrepreneur is you've got sort of two sides of the business. You, you have to decide, am I going to work in the business or am I going to work on the business? And those are two mm -hmm. totally different things. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the right structure. You've got to have the right system. And that's working on the business. But then you've actually got to go ring the dinner bell. You've got to actually do the things that make you money. Uh, so working in it and working on it can be two totally different things. As an employee, you spend most of your time working in it. But as an entrepreneur, you've got to be able to turn that off and go work on it for the greater good of everyone. And when you figure that out, you're probably on the right track. Yeah. Interesting point. Yeah, because you really are wearing two different hats in mm -hmm. those scenarios. Excellent point. Um, you know, and most people, I can't remember any longer what the stats are. You might know, but I mean, most people fail how many times at their initial entrepreneurial endeavors. They fail, yeah. you know, it, it takes one or two or three if you're willing to keep going, you know, maybe three or four times before you finally find some measure in, of success in, in your initiative. Um, but you never know where it's going to lead. And, and I say that because, well, um, my, well, my first entrepreneurial endeavor was at age... 13 when my girlfriend and I ha were babysitting because what else do you do when you're 13 to make money, right? So we're babysitting and we come up with this idea and we go, well, let's, um, let's advertise ourselves as a duo. We'll, we'll babysit together for the same price that they would pay for one person. And then we marketed, you know, the advantages of that, which were, you know, if we're both there, um, it's safer. If there's an emergency, there's two of us. Um, if, you know, we won't be talking on the phone to friends because we got each other there, you know, blah, blah, blah. If you have more than one kid, now there's two babysitters. 
And then, of course, that was like in the 70s. So, there, so the way we advertised was the good old-fashioned bulletin boards in the grocery stores. Remember, some of them still have bulletin boards where you can sell stuff and advertise. So we would make those little paper things with the little tags and our phone number that you pull off on the bottom. And then we literally turned it into a business. We had regular clients. You know, we had our Wednesday client and our Friday clients and our Saturday clients. And that was my first, I didn't realize it until I was an adult, but that was actually really my first um, adventure in being an entrepreneur. <laughs> and then the next one with the same girlfriend at the age of 21, we uh, started our own modeling agency in Minneapolis. So I had grown up in the business there. So I knew all of the, I knew all of the photographers and the clients and stuff. So we started this business, um, which was a colossal failure because, you know, we're 21. Um, however, that is where I met my husband. Well, there you go. So, so there we go. It was a uh, it was a is a massive failure, but the good thing that came out of it is, over thirty six years later, I'm married to the man of my dreams. It worked <laughs> so out. It all worked out. So you never know. You have to be willing. I think if, like you said, if you really want, if you really really want to go out and do something, um, be your own boss, um, have your own business. <clears throat> you know, I think you got to have the courage to just go out there and try it and you never know where it might lead. Just, yeah, that's exactly right. Who knows? All right. So yours though, ultimately led you to this whole universe of podcasting. Yeah. 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 So, and I mean, for you literally, like it's a universe. You, you, you're not just, you know, sitting in your basement, putting out <laughs> a podcast, you know, an hour's worth of content once a week. You literally are spinning a lot of plates. So I think that there's a lot of people that figure um, that they have something to say and would like to start a podcast. And so I think it'd be really fun to talk a little bit about, you know, your, your passion about that and then maybe help give, give our listeners some guidance on how they can jump into that and give it a try. If it's something that is, you know, a box they want to check. Sure. Well, no, this is a, the fun part of my life is, is the podcasting side. And it was all a happy accident. As I grew my mortgage business, you know, one of the biggest and most important things in sales that you're going to look for is leads, right? You've got to have an opportunity to find new customers. And so one of the things we adopted is in 2008, uh, after the, the big housing collapse happened, there was a, a major constriction in the mortgage business. So when I first started doing loans here in, in Huntsville, Alabama in 2001, if you opened up the yellow pages, there were probably 17 pages of mortgage companies. Well, at the end of 2008, as we rolled into 2009, there was one page. Uh, everyone had gotten out of the business. All of the competition had gone under, but at the same time, my income had sort of plateaued. Uh, so I guess this was my going rogue moment. I decided I'm going to go advertise right now. And what, what, what caused me to make that decision is all of my competition was gone. No longer were there five or six local mortgage companies on every TV or radio station. There was no one advertising at all. And I read something from Warren Buffett that said, be greedy when others are fearful. And I realized no one in my space is advertising right now, but rates are really good. Why aren't they advertising? They're not advertising because, well, if you're trying to cut expenses because your volume and your revenues are down, one of the first things to go, advertise. Mm. So if they had dedicated 10% of their income to that or their revenue to that, they could still keep some people on and just quit advertising. Well, here's the cosmic joke of that. If you stop advertising, you will eventually have to let more people go because fewer loans will be originated. So to me, it was chicken and the egg, but my income had plateaued. I had been roughly around the same income from 07, 08, and I wanted to make sure that 09 was much, much better. So in April of 09, I took what I had pigeonholed over here in my bank account that I wasn't doing anything with and had no plans for, and it was around $60,000. And I said, I'm going to spend all of this over the next two months. And $60,000 will buy you a lot of television and radio in Huntsville, Alabama. Hmm. So I went from not anywhere to everywhere, billboards, radio, TV, everywhere. And at the end of the second month, I had more than made it all back. So it worked. And now I'm really growing. Um, but before I hit that button to do that, I went from, say, a 1,200 square foot office to a 5,000 square foot office. And I'll never forget, my mom is thinking, boy, you're going to bankrupt this year. What are we doing? And I sort of had the joke you said a minute ago, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. I knew that everyone else is getting out of the business, but I'm not. This is all I know how to do. And this is all I want to do. 
So I'm doubling down because no one else is. And it created a real opportunity. So we went from, I don't know, 20 loans a month to 150 loans that fast. Oh and my so God. That meant we That's... could create a lot of new jobs. We created a lot of new locations. We expanded into Tennessee and it really, really worked. So I went rogue and it worked, uh, but eventually the model got out of hand. Oh my God, that was just such an amazing conversation with Conrad. I love his take on entrepreneurship and hearing his story. I had no idea, even though we're, we're friends and he and my husband are colleagues, uh, they've been working together for a while now. I had no idea about his beginnings and how he got to where he is now. So that was fascinating. Um, we are going to have more with Conrad in part two. So make sure that you subscribe so that you get notified when it drops next week. And of course, as always, head on over to lauriebischoff.com so you can find out what Private Coaching With Me is all about. Meanwhile, stay feisty, my friends. Stay hungry and go make some epic shift happen in your life. We'll see you next week. Oh, and you too, Gary Vee.